world was shocked when Jack Unterweger, a celebrated Austrian writer and journalist, was arrested for a series of brutal murders. But what made this case particularly chilling was that Unterweger had already been convicted of murder once before and had served 15 years in prison for it. How did he slip through the cracks again, even after being released from prison? In this episode, we'll take a look at the case of Jack Unterweger and explore the disturbing truth about how he was able to become a prolific cross-continent serial killer, claiming victims in Austria, the USA and the Czech Republic. The transnational nature of his spree posed challenges to law enforcement agencies, requiring cooperation and collaboration between authorities in different countries to bring him to justice. As always, viewer discretion is advised. There are crime scene photos, and there are some details in the case that some may find disturbing. With that said, we invite you to sit down and get comfortable, because we've got a story to tell you. In Austria, women of the street trading favours for money have been legal for many years. Heidi Hammerer had been a registered street worker in the country for over 10 years. She was used to all kinds of strange requests from her clients, but she was always cautious as she had been assaulted before. Heidi was last seen near a parking garage and then disappeared. Her body was found three weeks later by two hikers. She had been strangled with her pantyhose and had been left naked and lying face down, and her body had been quite well preserved because of the winter weather. She had bruises on both wrists, which indicated that she had been restrained. There was no foreign DNA found on her body, but there were two cloth fibres. And then soon after, three more bodies were discovered. Brunhilde Masser, aged 39, was found near a stream bed in Graz, while Elfriede Schrem, also from Graz, was found in nearby woods. The body of Silvio Zagler, aged 23, was discovered in a strand of trees. They had all been left in various states of undress, all facing down. Then, in less than a month, Sabine Mozzi, Regina Prem and Corin Eroglu each vanished without a trace from the streets of Vienna, a third Austrian city. All had been street workers. Now the police had an additional area to patrol, but no more crime scenes for finding clues. On the 4th of April 1991, a task force was created with top Austrian investigators. Initially, they didn't think it was the same killer, but inevitably they started seeing a pattern. Because the victims had been killed in the same way and the crime scenes were so familiar, they were now convinced it was the same killer. This was Austria's first serial killer in modern history. They had no experience in dealing with a killer like this. Dr. Ernst Geiger was the lead investigator. No lead was promising. All, all the, the leads uh, ended nowhere. We had no real suspect. But there were no obvious leads and as yet no suspects. But that all changed when they received a call from a retired detective. Olga Schenner had been keeping an eye on the media coverage of these gruesome crimes happening in Vienna, Graz and Bregenz and something about the way the killer was operating reminded him of a murderer he had dealt with before, a guy named Johann Jack Unterweger. Back in 1974, Schenner had investigated two murders. One of the victims was an 18-year-old girl named Margaret Schaefer, who was a friend of a street worker named Barbara Skoltz. Apparently, Unterweger and Skoltz had robbed Schaefer's house and then lured her into a car where they took her to the woods. Unterweger tied her up, beat her, and demanded certain intimate acts from her. When she refused, he got even more violent and ended up strangling her to death with her own bra. During the investigation, Unterweger actually confessed to the crime, but he had this strange defense in court, claiming that he had imagined his mother in front of him and just couldn't control his anger. The forensic psychologist who examined him described him as a sexually sadistic psychopath with aggressive tendencies. In short, a real monster. Schenner also mentioned the murder of another sex worker named Marcia Horvath, who was strangled with her stockings and a necktie, and then thrown into Lake Salzachsee near Salzburg. Although Unterweger wasn't investigated for this because he was already in prison, Schenner was pretty convinced that he was behind it. Jack was illiterate, and he used his time in jail to learn to read and write. He acquainted himself with the great writers. He edited a prison newspaper and a literary review, and eventually he was writing poems, short stories and plays that got some attention in the outside world. In 1984, his prison autobiography Purgatory was a bestseller, and his rage-filled tale Terminus Prison won a prestigious literary prize. 
Notably, Unterweger leveraged his literary talents to capture the attention of Vienna's literary circles. His intriguing persona, coupled with his boyish charm, quickly propelled him to celebrity status. Intellectuals and historians like Peter Humer were particularly captivated by his 1983 autobiography, praising its authenticity and emotional depth. This sentiment led to the endorsement of petitions advocating for his early release on parole. Consequently, Unterweger was granted parole in May 1990 after serving only a 15-year sentence. This information that August Schenner gave the investigators was a very important lead and shone the spotlight squarely on Jack Unterweger. Could this renowned author and seemingly reformed man be the killer? The investigators looked into his background. Johann Jack Unterweger was born in Styria, Austria in 1951 and had a troubled and unstable childhood. His mother Theresia got involved with American soldiers during the occupation of Austria and ended up getting pregnant and was even jailed for fraud. After his birth, Theresia named him after his supposed father, Jack Becker, who she claimed was an American soldier she had met in Trieste. When he was just two years old, his mother was arrested again and he was left in the care of his grandfather in the Alpine countryside of Corinthia. From what Jack later recounted, his grandfather was a violent and heavy drinking man and he felt abandoned and unloved during this time. As he grew older, Jack's desire to find his mother intensified and he even travelled to Salzburg to look for her, but he didn't have any luck. Jack experienced more heartbreak when he learnt that his aunt Anna, a street worker, had been murdered by one of her customers. This added to his already troubled and chaotic life, leaving him overwhelmed with grief. By his late teens, he had started committing robbery and was pimping women. He was quick to anger and at the age of 16 was jailed for an attack on a street worker. He was in and out of jail. But after his release from prison after serving his 15 years, he was seemingly a new man. In his new life, Unterweger becomes the darling of Viennese intellectuals. He was much in demand, attending book launches, literary soirees and opening nights. His book Purgatory was made into a movie and he was a frequent guest on talk shows. A suave and stylish figure in white suits, silk shirts and gold chains, he drove expensive cars with a license plate, Jack One. He was good looking and gregarious, an author with clout, who showed up regularly in Vienna's trendy champagne bars and nightclubs to charm the women. Another thing Unterweger was good at was sniffing out stories that the public craved to read, and it wasn't long before someone had the idea that he ought to be covering the string of murders, since he certainly knew about that subject firsthand. He avidly pursued these cases, wrote about them, and talked about them on television, while also promoting his books. He hounded investigators about why they had not yet arrested someone or offered the public any information. He interviewed street workers in the streets and alerted the public that their worst fears were true. Austria had a serial killer. Everyone wanted to hear what he had to say on the matter. The police, having a better sense of this flamboyant killer-turned-reporter, instituted discreet surveillance on him to see exactly what he was doing. To their disappointment, he did nothing suspicious. He went about his business, meeting literary colleagues and dining with various women. Three days after the surveillance started, he went to the USA, but they knew he would be back. In the meantime, the investigation continued. Tom Mueller, a psychologist of the criminal investigation team, joined the investigation. When we started the investigation against Jack Unterweger, it was pretty hard because uh, all his friends were within the media and they couldn't understand that he could be um, the bad guy. Geiger and Mueller started to cross-check Jack's whereabouts, where each murder had been committed. Slowly, the investigators started putting together the puzzle pieces of Jack Unterweger's movements. They dug through his credit card receipts from hotels, restaurants and rental car agencies to get a sense of where he had been. And after months of piecing it all together, they managed firstly to place him in Graz, when Brunhilde Massa was murdered, and again in March, when Elfriede Schrempf vanished. They even found him in Bregenz in December, around the time Heidi Marine Hamero was taken. A witness said Unterweger looked like the man Hamero was last seen with that night, wearing a brown leather jacket and a red knit scarf. And what was outstanding for us, that exactly at any time where Czech uh, hang out at any place in Prague, in the western part of Austria, in the, south, in the southern part of Austria, exactly in that time period there was always a dead body somewhere in the woods. They then found that he had been in Prague the previous September, and his visit coincided with the unsolved murder of Blanka Bokova. She was found in the woods, covered in dirt and leaves, and wearing just her socks. The poor woman was strangled with her undergarments 
and her jewellery was left untouched. The investigators noticed some eerie similarities in the crime, almost like a distinct signature. Now it's true that all of this wasn't enough to prove his guilt in court, but it certainly raised some eyebrows. They knew they had to talk to Unterweger and see how he reacted when they put some serious questions to him. Regina Prem had been missing for months, and her husband and son were desperately waiting for news of her. Her killer phoned the family at their unlisted number and accurately described what she was wearing on the night that she vanished. He claimed to be her executioner, saying that God had ordered him to do it. He coldly revealed that she had been left in a place of sacrifice with her face turned towards hell. And the most chilling part was when he said, I gave 11 of them the punishment they deserved. Three months later, in January 1992, Regina Prem's husband found five empty cigarette packs of her favourite brand in his mailbox. But that wasn't all. Among those packs was a passport photo of her son, something she always carried in her purse. You can only imagine the fear and shock that gripped the family. It was like something out of a horror movie. It's hard to fathom the terror and anguish this family must have endured. When they finally found her body, it was confirmed that this was his eighth victim. On the 22nd of October 1991, they brought Jack in for questioning. The lead interviewer already knew his suspect because as a journalist, Unterweger had questioned him about the series of murders for an article. The investigators hoped that their interest in him might be sufficient to pressure Unterweger to confess. But while he admitted seeing street workers, he denied knowing any of the victims. He was familiar with them only because he was a reporter. Unterweger had no alibis, but equally, the investigators had no evidence. They had to give up. And the murders continued. The investigators were no closer to finding the killer, but they believed Jack was their strongest lead. They tracked down the car he used when he was first released from prison, but as it had been over a year since Unterweger had last driven it, they weren't very hopeful of finding any clues. They found only one single thread of hair. They sent this down to the University of Bern for DNA analysis. Miraculously, they got a profile and matched the DNA of the first victim, Blanka Brokova from Prague in the Czech Republic. As the investigation intensified, Geiger, the lead investigator, began questioning Austrian street workers, hoping to gather more clues. They described Unterweger's creepy desire for them to wear handcuffs that raised a red flag, as it seemed to match the killer's twisted pattern. Armed with this crucial piece of evidence, they obtained a warrant to search Unterweger's apartment in Vienna. Unfortunately, he wasn't there when they arrived, but that didn't stop them from conducting a thorough search. They had a hunch about him, and they were determined to find more evidence. Among the discoveries were a menu and receipts from a seafood restaurant in Malibu in California. They also have photographs of Unterweger posing with female members of the Los Angeles Police Department. That raised even more eyebrows. We will look into this American trip a little bit later. They also found the brown leather jacket and red knit scarf that witnesses described him wearing. The puzzle pieces were starting to come together, and the pictures they were forming pointed directly at Unterweger. The investigators were building a circumstantial case against him, and every lead they uncovered brought them closer to the truth. I would say Jack was a very, very good example for a typical type of organized offender, and I would say he was a typical uh, example for a natural psychologist. He was able to understand the needs of other people. He was able um, to come close to other people, to listen to other people, and then to manipulate them. But Geiger needed help. He had no experience investigating a serial killer and was stumped. He went to the US Embassy in Vienna to ask the FBI for help. He spoke to an FBI agent stationed there, Julianne Slisko. She contacted Greg McCreary at the Criminal Profiling Unit in Quantico. The Austrians contacted the FBI uh, because they were trying to tap into our experience of dealing with serial homicide investigations. Uh, this was the first serial murder investigation in modern history in, in Austria. Slisko also sent a telex to the Los Angeles PD to advise them that the suspect had been in their city nine months ago. Mueller and Geiger started to prepare for their trip to the US, making sure they had all case files and notes. They received a call from Fred Miller of the LAPD, who had seen the telex. They had also had a spate of murders in the last summer that were very similar to their cases. And Geiger added this to the case files for Greg McCreary. 
Now we need to travel back in time to Unterweger's USA trips. The first one was in the summer of 1990. He had grand plans to infiltrate the city's literary and Hollywood scene. He stayed at the Cecil Hotel, known for its dark history and association with the serial killer Richard Ramirez. While he aimed to interview famous figures like Charles Bukowski and Schur, his primary goal was to research the city's seedy underworld for his project, The Dark Side of Los Angeles. Jack went to the LAPD Public Relations Office and asked if he could sign up for their ride-along program. This program allowed citizens to tag along with the police as they did their shifts. He showed them his credentials and said that he was researching the difference between Europe and USA street workers for an article he was writing. This is how he found the red light districts and the street workers. What better way to find his potential victims? On his second trip on June the 11th, he flew to Los Angeles for a vacation and left on 17th of July in 1991. The first victim to be found, Shannon Exley, had been strangled with her own bra on June the 20th, 1991. She was a 20-year-old trying to turn her life around, but her efforts were tragically cut short. A week later, 33-year-old Irene Rodriguez met a similar fate, being found with a bra tightly knotted around her neck in a freight company parking lot. In July, a solar eclipse cast an eerie shadow over Los Angeles as a group of onlookers gathered on Coral Canyon Road in Malibu, but their attention was quickly diverted from the celestial event when they stumbled upon a horrifying sight the lifeless body of a woman lying under a bush. She had a tightly knotted bra around her neck and was identified as Sherry Long, a local streetwalker. Detective Fred Miller and his partner Jim Harper of the LAPD, familiar with a series of recent murders, suspected that a serial killer had struck yet again. The murders in LA seemed to fit in with the European murders. This immediately uh, lit the fires and uh, it was just unbelievable to go all these eight months and, and without the suspect turning up or another murder, this was uh, quite a boost to the investigation. Dr. Lynn Herald at the LA County Sheriff's Department Crime Lab was astounded by the killer's unusual method of using bras as makeshift nooses. In order for the knots to be made, the wearing apparel had to be dismantled in some form. It's not like the bras were just taken and tied in a square knot, but they were stripped of the elastic always on the left side. And if three people randomly went out and strangled three people, it is extremely unlikely that all three of them would come up with this same scenario. She pointed out that the murders occurred within short intervals of each other, indicating a chilling pattern. Unbeknownst to the city, the charming Austrian, Jack Unterweger, had arrived in America. Little did they know that behind his charismatic facade lay a sadistic killer with a dark history of murders in his home country. And this brings us up to date and we can finally return to the present time with the investigators on a plane to Quantico. At Quantico, the Austrian investigators arrived with 20 boxes. McCreary initially focused on crime and crime scene details without access to suspect information. I wanted all the case materials on all of the homicides, uh, victimology, a lot about the victims and their background, their history, uh, the method and manner of death, autopsy reports, crime scene photos, uh, everything that uh, was available from an investigative point of view. What we didn't want is uh, suspect information. We just wanted to take an objective look at all of the cases to see what we thought, if they might be related or not, and the type of offender that we thought might be uh, most probably involved in committing these crimes. He noticed a pattern among the 11 murders involving similar victimology and manners of disposal. Most victims were left outside with branches of foliage covering them. Strangulation was the cause of death for most, with restraint bruises on their arms and wrists. The killer seemed organized, careful, and smart. It became clear that there was a pattern uh, to these homicides, uh, th that there was sort of a ritualistic behavior that occurred in each of these crime scenes. Each woman was similar in nature. They were uh, uh, on the street when they were contacted, when they were picked up, very usually very surreptitiously. No one really saw these women get into a car. Uh, they were transported out to an area, they were murdered, uh, ligature strangled with an article of their own clothing, disposed in a similar manner <clears throat> uh, in an outdoor setting, uh, absence of sexual assault. I would say Jack was uh, a very, very good 
example for a typical type of organized offender, and I would say he was a typical uh, example for a natural psychologist. He was able to understand the needs of other people. He was able um, to come close to other people, to listen to other people, and then to manipulate them. Back in Switzerland, analysts at the University of Bern had finished their examination of the leather jacket and red scarf from Unterweger's apartment. Fibres from those items were consistent with those found on the body of Heidi Marine Hammerer. No one could definitely identify the scarf as the source of origin, yet equally it could not be eliminated. Using the Violent Crime Apprehension Program database, they matched the 11 murders to each other and only one other case in California which was already solved. This indicated it was unlikely for multiple offenders to engage in such specific behaviour during the same period. When I overlaid Jack Unterweger's timeline on the timeline of the crimes, they fit perfectly. And that was really a dawning moment, the, the aha moment, the moment that's really exciting in analysis like this because now you have a suspect whose movements correlate perfectly with each of the homicides as well as his prior homicide that he had been convicted for bearing a lot of similarities to these homicides. We can put him in each place at each time these crimes occurred. And uh, either uh, Jack Underweger was the unluckiest man in the world to have been there or he was an excellent suspect. Comparing Unterweger's timeline and MO in Margaret Schaefer's murder to the other cases confirmed his involvement. An analysis of knots used to tie ligatures in Los Angeles and Austria also matched, strengthening the behavioural analysis. This allowed Geiger to escalate the case to the next step and get an arrest warrant. Unterweger could see what was coming, and in the depths of his troubled mind, a desperate plan took shape as he sought to evade law enforcement at all costs. Heeding warnings from his associates about the imminent police pursuit, he and his girlfriend Bianca Mrak made a daring escape from Austria, seeking refuge in the United States. But crossing international borders couldn't shield his dark secrets. He misled customs officials about his past murder conviction. He frantically reached out to Austrian newspapers, protesting his innocence and seeking support from acquaintances back home. However, the authorities proved astute, tracing the financial trail back to Marak's mother, ultimately leading them straight to the fugitive couple. Unterweger offered an audacious deal to the authorities, proposing to return and cooperate if they dropped their arrest warrants, firmly believing he could prove his innocence. In Miami, he penned a heartfelt letter, yearning for publication, hoping the public would see his flight as an act of desperation rather than guilt. Persistently, he tried to disseminate his letter, even striking deals with magazines to share his daring escape story. Unterweger denied every accusation, claiming Grass authorities had fabricated the evidence to make him a scapegoat for their resentment over his parole. The investigators visited Bianca's mother to see if she knew anything. She had been sending them money. When Bianca asked for more money, she informed the police and they now knew where they could wait for Jack. And the law finally caught up with him. Initially attempting to charm the officers, Unterweger joked about featuring them in his future literary works. However, when questioned about the Austrian murders, he broke down emotionally. Evidentiary measures followed, including examining his travel journal, which revealed disturbing thoughts about murdering his girlfriend. Fully aware of the gravity of the situation, the authorities urged Unterweger not to prolong extradition proceedings, emphasizing the grim potential outcome of facing the gas chamber if he were tried and convicted in California. He chose to return to Austria, where the true story of Jack Unterweger's dark and haunting journey would finally come to light. After Jack's arrest uh, in Miami, uh, we dealt uh, almost on a daily schedule with the Austrian authorities, uh, trying to put the information they had on their murders together with the information on the California murders. Uh, the Austrian authorities made trips to Los Angeles. They provided us with uh, whatever materials we needed, uh, photographs of the crime scenes, information on their victims, information on Jack. If an Austrian citizen is committing a crime wherever in the world, uh, the Austrian law is responsible for that guy. So um, the American authorities uh, gave the clearance to bring Mr. Uh, Unterweger here back to Austria. In June 1994, Jack Unterweger's trial began in Graz, Austria. As an Austrian citizen, he faced multiple charges, including murders in Los Angeles, Prague and Austria. 
Despite the overwhelming evidence against him, Unterweger maintained a delusional sense of confidence and sought interviews to boast about his expected legal victory. The OJ case here in LA is the only thing I can kind of equate it to. It was that big over there. It was all over the newspapers, headlines. I mean, and when we came into, into this town to testify, uh, it was a big deal. We were all over the front page of the paper, the whole deal. The prosecution presented a strong case, including evidence from Detective Jim Harper and Dr. Lynn Herald about the knots used in the murders. Greg McCrary discussed the behavioral patterns that linked all the crimes and connected them to Unterweger's first murder. The psychiatric reports highlighted Unterweger's sadistic nature and character witnesses spoke of his manipulative behavior. Unterweger, dressed elegantly, represented himself in court and was obviously hoping his charm and appearance would sway the jury. He admitted to his criminal past, but claimed to have changed and been rehabilitated. However, the evidence was too compelling to ignore, and public opinion began to shift against him, including that of his girlfriend, Bianca Marak. Crime lab reports on the ligature knots, traces of Blanca Bokova's hair found in his BMW, and red fibres from his scarf discovered on Brunhilde's body formed a damning case against the defendant. Still, Unterwege remained unrepentant, defiantly pleading his innocence. He slyly manipulated the situation, pointing fingers at an imaginary real killer who allegedly laughed at their failed attempts to pin the crimes on him. As the trial stretched on for two and a half grueling months, even Unterweger's staunchest supporters in the press began to waver. The literary establishment and his girlfriend Bianca Mrak also distanced themselves from the devious psychopath. Ultimately, justice was served and the court found Unterweger guilty on nine counts of murder encompassing victims from Prague, Los Angeles and Austria. The sentence was life in prison, a fitting punishment for his heinous crimes. But in a final macabre twist, Unterweger, a man obsessed with control, couldn't bear the thought of losing his grip. Seizing an opportune moment when the guards were momentarily absent, he took his own life, using the very knot he had so cruelly practiced on his victims. And thus ended the dark and haunting tale of Jack Unterweger, a man whose twisted desires led him down a path of destruction, manipulation and ultimately a chilling demise. The case of Jack Unterweger left law enforcement with valuable lessons etched in blood and terror. As this chilling true crime story unfolded, investigators learned crucial techniques that would forever shape their approach to catching serial killers. Psychological profiling emerged as a potent tool, delving into the twisted minds of criminals like Unterweger. The FBI's investigative analysis revealed the dark compulsions driving his heinous acts. Understanding the psychology and behavioural patterns of these monsters became key to narrowing down suspects and cracking intricate cases. Unterweger's reign of terror spanned multiple countries, forcing law enforcement agencies to collaborate like never before. Cross-jurisdiction cooperation became paramount, with agencies sharing information and evidence to build a solid case. His tale also cast doubt on the concept of rehabilitation. Unterweger's cunning deception raised questions about the accuracy of rehabilitation assessments, demanding a more nuanced approach to assessing released offenders' potential risks. The importance of forensic evidence and cutting-edge technology took centre stage in Unterweger's downfall. Ligature knots, hair strands and fibres left a damning trail, connecting him to his vile deeds. This emphasised the value of meticulous crime scene investigation and preserving crucial evidence. The media's influence weighed heavily on this dark drama. Unterweger's charm and literary skills garnered public support, influencing perceptions and opinions. Responsible media reporting became vital, avoiding sensationalism that could hinder investigations and compromise justice. We also want to honour the memories of the victims, whose lives were brutally cut short by a monster driven by darkness. May the memories of these victims serve as a reminder of the importance of seeking justice and safeguarding the vulnerable in our society. The Jack Unterweger case is a reminder that there is no such thing as a perfect criminal. Even the most talented and charismatic people can be capable of great evil. And there you have it. What are your thoughts on this case? Please let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, and if you want to see more of these cases, please subscribe, it really helps us. Remember, keep your loved ones close, and stay safe until next time.